I want to give people a permission to continue being fuck ups. That's like one of the core parts of my brand. I didn't make up this term, but I, I like it. Cathartic normalization. I want to give people permission to be a mess because that is the human situation. And a lot of our suffering comes from walking around pretending otherwise. At Mechanism, we build iconic brands with soul and science. The soul is culturally relevant brand building, and the science is the always on marketing activities that drive the bottom line. Learn more at mechanism.com. You probably know as well as I do, it's easy to get lost in the details of those everyday small inconveniences. What's for dinner? That looming deadline? Whether or not your joke landed in that meeting? It's also just as easy to switch our brains to autopilot when we get overwhelmed and we can disappear into the scroll universe of social media or just veg out and stream a show. We also have that narrator voice in our heads, the constant critic, you know, the one, the complainer, that voice that really doesn't serve us and doesn't wire us for success. But the simple practice of mindfulness might offer a solution. And my guest today believes that everyone can be at least 10% happier if they work mindfulness into their daily life routine. I'm joined by Dan Harris, who has spent more than 20 years as a journalist for ABC, where he was the co-anchor of Nightline and the weekend editions of Good Morning America. He's covered wars, natural disasters, and he's even spent 48 hours in solitary confinement to better understand the criminal justice system. Today, Dan is the best-selling author of the meditation book, 10% Happier, and the host of the podcast that bears the same name. In this episode, you'll learn not only how, but why you should incorporate a meditation practice into your personal and professional life. You'll learn about some of the challenges that first led Dan down the path of mindfulness and how you can apply those lessons in your career. And you'll discover how to better manage your own thoughts in order to live a happier and healthier life. All right, listeners, let's dive in and learn about the soul and science of mindfulness. Before we get into your book, all your work, I want to know your origin story and how you started your career. Give me a little bit of what you went to school for and how you ended up in the trajectory that that you were on. Sure. I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston. Both my parents were doctors and I was not a particularly good student, but my dad knew the dean at uh, Colby College, a little college in 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 Maine, which is now actually incredibly hard to get into, but not not quite the case back when I went. And I had mixed up in my mind uh, the movies and television news. I didn't know there was much of a difference, but I was interested in doing something jazzy. Uh, I don't know how that word just came out of my mouth, but anyway, I was interested in I doing. I think we some, know what you mean. Some something splashy. Yes, with some yeah. with some razzle dazzle. If I'm going to stay old school, and I did a couple things during college. One was I interned. I did a bunch of internships at in TV news at different TV news stations, and I also went to film school for a semester at NYU. And while going to film school at NYU, I realized I was not very good at movie making. Uh, but I loved the internships I was doing in TV news. And uh, so when I graduated from college at, um, in 1993, I got a job at a little TV station in Bangor, Maine for five fifty an hour where I was working behind the scenes part time, eating a lot of mac and cheese. And um, after a couple months, they put me on the air as a field reporter. And then I, I got to anchor some stuff and it just kind of all went from there. And when you got that first job, Were you like, I'll get coffee, I'll do whatever they want, but I'm going to stay here until I get on the air? Exactly right. That was that I I had that attitude of it doesn't matter. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll just live. I lived in like a spare room in some elderly woman's uh, uh, house in Bangor, Maine, and ate, like I said, mac and cheese. And but again, I, I had some financial support from my family, speaking of, you know, advantages, not a ton, but some. Uh, so I had a net under me that I think other folks didn't have. Uh, but I was I was willing to do anything. I operated a camera in the studio. Um, I was I learned how to write um, the basic news items that the anchors were reading on the air. Um, I just worked my ass off until I in, until they put me on the air. And once you got on, how long were you at that station before you moved somewhere else? Uh, about once I got on probably a year and a half before I moved to Portland, Maine, 
where I was made the anchor of the six and 11 o'clock news on the weekends on the NBC station at age 23. <laughs> uh, and I did that for like two years. And then I went to Boston for to a small one of the smaller stations in Boston, like a cable news, local cable news station in Boston. I did that for a couple of years. And then I got to ABC News in the year 2000 when I was 28. And then how long were you there? And how did you move through that system? I was at ABC for 21 years. I retired two and a half years ago. Um, and it was awesome. I loved it. Um, I still, you know, I have so many close friends. I was back on Good Morning America recently shilling my uh, book. Um, they're very kind to me. If I've got something I want to promote, they'll put me on. And and, I, and it was, I hadn't been on in a while. Maybe once, That was maybe it was the second time I'd been back since I retired. And um, it was very moving, actually, <laughs> because I have so many close friends there. And so, I mean, 21 years of my life is a long time. Um, but to answer the question you actually asked, I started as uh, they hired me to anchor the overnight news, the, the the news in the middle of the night, which at that time was anchored by a guy named Anderson Cooper. Um, Anderson decided after I arrived that he was not ready to step down from that show yet. So they didn't actually know what to do with me. Uh, and I got a chance to start doing some stories for the weekend evening news. And then Peter Jennings, who was the anchor of the main broadcast and, and a huge, huge figure, an American icon, although he was actually Canadian, um, saw some of my stories and asked me to come do some stories for his show, which was the coolest thing probably to this day that has ever happened to me. And that was it. It was, you know, after that, I just, I was this roving globe trotting reporter. I mean, and nine 11 happened and then I was off covering war zones and, um, I just, I had this incredible education all over the planet. And then they started letting me anchor shows. Um, I anchored nightline and the weekend edition of good morning America, the weekend edition of world news tonight. Um, so I was doing a kind of a mixture of anchoring the news and, uh, reporting the news. And yeah, I did that until I, uh, until my side hustle took over. That anchoring started in like 2006, something like that. They started giving me my first shots to fill in as an anchor on good morning America in like 2003. And, okay. uh, so I was what, quite young in my early thirties. Then I got my first real perch in 2005 as the Sunday evening news anchor. Uh, and I did that for five years until I was became the weekend anchor of Good Morning America. And then I, in 2013, added on anchor of Nightline while I was doing the weekends. That's a lot. Yeah, which was insane. Um, That's seven days a week. It was seven days a week, shifting between evening and morning schedules. And at yeah. this time, right around the time that I got the job at as the anchor of Nightline, my first book, 10% Happier, came out, was way more successful than I thought it was going to be. So I, there was a period of time in around, from around 2014 to 2019 or 20 where I was doing the following simultaneously. Anchoring Nightline, anchoring Weekend GMA, traveling around the world and doing investigative uh, reporting plus breaking news, writing books giving speeches uh, around the world to corporations, uh, hosting a podcast, starting a company, a venture-backed company that, uh, that created a meditation app. And I think I'm missing something, but I was doing at least all of those things. And you did that for like 10 years, nine years? I did that all told probably five or six years until I started to serially divest myself of these responsibilities. So I quit Nightline and paired back to, I just basically went part-time at ABC News. Then I quit ABC News altogether. Yeah. So I've been just kind of cutting back and cutting back because I it was, it was very dumb and selfish and it had a lot of negative consequences for my family and my own psyche and my colleagues. So I, I really learned the hard way that I was overloading. But also you kept optionality open until you saw your other business kind of take off. That's exactly right. I, and that was what I was consciously doing. 
Um, but I think that there was a lot of fear in the system that was unnecessary and that if I had more confidence, honestly, and less anxiety, I also am a, an extremely anxious person. I sometimes joke that my career was a triumph of narcissism over fear. Um, <laughs> but the anxiety has been with me every step of the way. Um, and I think that really fueled the overcommitment. But anxiety, anxiety can also be a superpower because it keeps you frosty. You might be confident and narcissistic, but you also get to work hard and hedge your bets as well, because that anxiety voice is not necessarily always negative. OK, so this you, we are touching on a huge subject, and this has been something that I have thought and written about and talked about extensively. And I think you're right with an asterisk, which is that we tend to take our stress, plotting, planning, conniving, anxiety too far. And in many cases, and certainly in my case, way too far. And where mindfulness, meditation, and I think therapy and other technologies, inner technologies that boost your self-awareness can help you do is see when you've cross the line between what I call constructive anguish and useless rumination. And this is an art and a science, really. It is, from, in my opinion, one of the life hacks par excellence, because you do need a certain amount. You want to be frosty. You want to be, you want your edge. Um, you want some vigilance, but too much actually reduces your edge, reduces your resiliency, reduces your creativity, and damages your relationships. And so right in there is something very important. How would you tell someone to find that riding the edge without going overboard? It's so individual, but there are many tools that help. I mentioned a few of them. I think meditation, specifically mindfulness meditation, is very helpful because and let, let me just describe the practice quickly so that you can understand how it's helpful. Beginning mindfulness meditation is really just three steps. And I know you know this because you've got some experience in this space. But um, in beginning mindfulness meditation, you kind of just sit quietly, close your eyes. That's the first step. Second step is bring your full attention to something neutral, like the feeling of your breath coming in and going out or the sounds in the environment or the feeling of your body sitting in the chair. And then the third step is as soon as you try to do this, your mind is going to wander a lot. You're going to start thinking you know, about, you know, what's for lunch. You start planning a homicide, whatever it is. Your mind just goes off and running. That's the moment when a lot of people think I can't do this. But actually, that is the moment of success because the whole game in meditation is just to see how wild the mind is so that your thoughts and urges and impulses don't own you as much. And this act of getting distracted and starting again, getting distracted and starting again, this is the means by which the brain changes in meditation and the results can be seen on the brain scans of people who meditate. The area of the brain associated with attention regulation literally grows, the area of the brain associated with stress literally shrinks. And so it's a very interesting results, but it goes right to your question, which is how do you know how to ride the line between useful anxiety and useless anxiety, mindfulness meditation, which wakes you up to your own inner processes is a great way to do that because you can wake up to, oh yeah, yeah, this, <laughs> this, I've thought about this enough. I can change the channel. I don't need to worry 18 more times about all of the deleterious consequences of a missed flight, for example. Um, uh, so let me just add another tool onto that it, it, for those who don't want to meditate, which is totally fine. But you also should. <laughs> I'm delicate around the word should, but it, there's certainly abundant evidence that it's good for you. But just if you're if you feel like you don't have time or you don't want to do it or whatever, um, just ask yourself this question when you're caught in anxiety. Is this useful? I got this from my meditation teacher, Joseph Goldstein, with whom you're familiar, um, an incredible person. And this is an amazing hack. When you notice yourself going down the toilet on any issue, is this useful? Do I need to be thinking about this right now? Have I thought about it enough? Is ruminating on this going to 
increase my odds of success or decrease them. It's a great way to, to you know, just as you said before, ride that line. I wanted to ask one question because then I want to talk about your book, but I want to ask a question of as you were doing mindful meditation and it was changing your life, you wrote this book about it. At the same time, your lifestyle, it was a little not connected to what you were necessarily writing about or discussing or talking about. How did you correlate that? In other words, you may have been doing the meditation, but you were also taking on too many things, maybe not being present enough. I'm, I'm assuming this, which I don't mean to, but in your mind, how, how were you like connecting the things you were telling people to do and then the way you were actually behaving? Is that a fair question? It's a great question. It's totally fair. And I'm going to try to spin it into, I'm going to answer it truthfully and then try to spin it into something that I think will be useful to anybody listening. Um, for sure, there was a disconnect between what I was talking about, the Dharma, Buddhism, and meditation, and the overcommitment that I was doing based in fear and also, of course, in greed and ambition. So th this was not a case where I was spreading the Dharma and also like committing crimes or acting in ways that were egregiously cruel, but I was making some stupid mistakes. The fact of the matter is you can do quite a bit of meditation, therapy, et cetera, et cetera, and still have blind spots. There was a great tweet a couple of months ago from a Zen master, Roshi Joan Halifax, who, who I admire quite, quite a lot. And uh, the tweet was a, a an image. It was of a very squiggly line, <laughs> it's just going all over the place randomly. And the caption was the path. Just because you start doing these self improvement things, does not mean perfection is on offer. And uh, I think that's actually a comforting thing. I want to give people a permission to continue being fuck ups. And I mean, I think that's like one of the core parts of my brand. I didn't make up this term, but I, I like it. Cathartic normalization. You know, that, that I, want, I want to give people permission to be a mess because that is the human situation. And a lot of our suffering comes, around, comes from walking around pretending otherwise. Uh, and so, yeah, I had, you know, five, six, seven, eight years of meditation under my belt, but was continuing to make some egregiously dumb mistakes. However, when they were pointed out to me, I really took action and started to, you know, remediate them. And that's where I think the benefit of meditation is. And that's where I think 10% happier, while that title was a joke, really, really does start to make sense because it's about marginal, messy improvement over time. I love the squiggly line. I think that's just such a good visual to keep in mind that that is the path. So your 10 year anniversary just came up for 10% happier. How I tame the voice in my head, reduce stress without losing my edge and found self-help that actually works. A true story by Dan Harris. <laughs> Tell me about, first of all, I remember meeting with you early before this book came out and I was, I, gave you like, you didn't listen to me, thankfully, but I was like 10% happier. Is that enough? I only remember it because I was eating meatballs that spilled all over my, my God. white shirt. I have a, a very color. clear memory of that moment. <laughs> just to interrupt you, I that moment <laughs> is so seared in my, just to set the scene or set the table to be a little cute for people who are listening. Jason and I were having lunch, must've been 12 years ago, and he spilled some spaghetti sauce on his shirt and I didn't tell him, which I should have. And I've gotten feedback more recently, like within the last five, 10 years, that one of my areas of weakness is that I am not good at giving direct feedback. So this moment with you of not telling you about the, about the, spaghetti and sauce. you were pissed. You were like, dude, <laughs> how can I be friends with you? If you like, don't, this is a thing you should, be playing. we went and bought a new shirt right after lunch yeah. uh, for you yeah. because you had a meeting or something like that. And yeah. I remember it so vividly because it speaks to one of my many weak spots. Um, anyway. So funny that you remember it and I remember it. But what I remember the most is, Dan, this book is awesome, but can we up the percentage? 10%, is that enough? And thank God you didn't listen to me because you've built a incredible brand around 10% happier. 
which is so smart because it is it seems achievable it that's why the actual works part you're like yeah like i that makes sense 10 percent would be great but in my marketing mind i was like oh i'd never market something like that because it doesn't seem like enough you know you know what you, you were not alone most people most people the vast majority of people were telling me it was a dumb title and more they were telling me that the whole project was stupid because a i was admitting some very embarrassing things about myself in the book that could have hurt my career and b who gives a shit anyway about meditation this was 10 years ago before it was as big as it is now um and you know again uh, my own publisher was trying to get me up to 30 percent happier i mean literally so <laughs> I, and I would love to say that I am some visionary or, or something like that. It's just, I, I think it's actually just another one of my weaknesses that can sometimes be a strength, which is that I'm very stubborn. Well, let me ask you a question about the title for my next book. Inner Peace Motherfuckers. <laughs> well, maybe that should be the title. Uh, that the Just to say, for anybody who's listening who doesn't know where that's coming from, I started doing Instagram eight or nine months ago, I had never done any social media really. And then my agents and everybody else in my life prevailed upon me to start doing social media, which I didn't want to do, but I actually, I really like it. And I started randomly saying at the end of the videos, inner peace motherfuckers. And now I'm selling t-shirts that say that we literally can't keep them in stock. I think it's brilliant. And it's actually your Instagram your little tools and advice, it's like probably my favorite thing that you do because it is human and real and super helpful. And I love inner, inner Peace Motherfuckers to me is like, that's a whole other brand. Well, so maybe that should be the name of the next book. Um, and I actually hadn't really thought of that. So I'm glad I'm glad I'm talking to you, a marketer, a really good marketer. The title is Me, comma, A Love Story. And... Uh, when I first thought of it, I started, I was laughing about it for days. I thought it was really funny. But what I'm surprised by is how few people get the joke. Um, and they think this is a book about narcissism or something like that. Um, so your thoughts. I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I immediately think, oh, that's a story about how I can get to a better version of me and spend time internally developing my character. Yes, it is to be cute, soul and science. What does science say is the number one thing you can do to make sure that you are happy, healthy and successful? The answer is the quality of your relationships. Most of us are working on our bodies or our diet or we're trying to achieve ketosis or we're tracking our sleep or counting our steps or what whatever. But and all of those things can be useful. But the most important thing is the quality of your relationship. So it's soul and science. That's the thesis of the book. I mean, it's great because there's so much data now that the quality of your social network and your relationships, relationships with yourself and then with others, having that network leads to longer life, yes. higher quality yes. of living, et cetera, et cetera. It is the, I don't know, the silver bullet. That is the silver bullet right there. It's as close to a silver bullet as we've got. And what's crazy, two crazy things. One, we live in a society that militates against quality relationships so effectively with such extreme prejudice. I mean, we are driven into our own information silos. We're driven uh, into our own phones. We're uh, uh, driven to believe that happiness comes from the next purchase or from the next achievement as opposed to the next conversation. Um, so everything about modern life drives us away from relationships. But this leads me to the second crazy thing, which is actually love is a skill. It's a set of skills. There are like little science-based things you can do throughout your day that will boost the quality of your relationships. And so again, now I'm just pitching my next book. Um, you know, you just had your 10th anniversary for 10% Happier. Tell me about some of the ways that the past 10 years, your life changed through the development of, of your new business and 10% Happier and culling everything down and kind of focusing on your modern guru status, which I'm sure you hate, <laughs> but just, <laughs> Just tell me a little bit about that, where you want to go next. 
I'm going to pick up on the thing you said about which I'm sure you hate. I think I'm at like a reasonably good spot with this, but I'd be interested to hear if you think I'm thinking about this correctly. I'm definitely not a proper meditation teacher. You know, like you work at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. You you work with two Zen monks, uh, Koshin and Shoto, both who've been on both of whom have been on my podcast many times and are close dear friends of mine. Those are trained professionals. Um, I believe in Koshin's case, he also has a uh, psychotherapy license, but they're, they're both, and I, Chodo might too, and they're both Zen priests who went through a ton of training. The medita- I'm not, I don't come out of the Zen school, I come out of the older Theravada school of Buddhism, that's where I've been practicing. And those guys, you know, I'm married to a doctor who did years and years and years of training. These meditation tre- teachers, the ones that I'm friends with, did even more. Um, and they've, so they've spent years of their lives cumulatively on silent meditation retreats, getting to know every back alley and cul-de-sac of the mind so that they can help other people work with their mind. That's not me. I don't have that qualification. What well, I'm more of like a gateway drug, a translator. Um, and so I, I, I'm actually comfortable with like quasi guru. I know enough, you know, I've been studying this for 15 years and I've done, you know, I do, uh, quite a a lot of meditation personally and in my daily life and on retreats and um, write books about this. I think about it quite deeply and do I've done more than 600 episodes of my podcast. So I actually feel reasonably comfortable teaching people some things with the caveat that I'm not a trained psychotherapist or a trained um, meditation teacher. So like quasi guru is a place where I'm like reasonably comfortable. Does that, how does that land for you? I I like quasi guru. Don't you think that is a benefit though. The gateway drug is is powerful because the more you can relate to everyday people like you, you know, the average person's not going to do 10 years of training to become a Buddhist monk, but everyone needs a little bit of Zen in their life. So I think it's a good place to be, right? I hope it's a benefit. I mean, yeah, I try to build my whole life around this idea of being useful. Um, I fail all the time, you know, constantly pulled into my old demons of selfishness and anger or whatever. But I am most effective, most successful, happiest when I'm in the altruistic mindset. Um, and and that doesn't mean self-sacrificing. You know, in Buddhism, there's this expression for the benefit of all beings. Well, you're part of all. So, you know, self-interest and other interests are in this interesting, like, double helix, self-reinforcing thing when properly understood. So yeah, I try to make that the centerpiece of my life. Yeah. For the benefit of all beings, including me. Yeah. A love story. Yeah, exactly. Well, but it's including me because you can't help other people unless you're helping yourself first. Correct. That is a, that is a founding philosophy. Can you share maybe some techniques if you're comfortable that you think are good gateway drug examples that people can do? You share this a lot on your Instagram, some key techniques that listeners can think about to tame the incessant voice in their heads, which we all all have. We all have it. I mean, one thing is just to know that, right? That's actually really powerful. Just to know that, as I often say, you you have this nonstop conversation, which if we broadcast aloud, you would be locked up. And when you're unaware of it, it owns you. You act out, as Joseph Goldstein says, you act out every thought like it's a tiny dictator. You're just completely owned by this incessant, insane stream of consciousness. Um, So just being aware of that, that you are not your thoughts, that you don't have to take your thoughts as seriously or personally as we habitually do is massively powerful. That for me was the key insight that opened up this whole situation for me. Don't lean into or run from the voices, acknowledge the voices and get back in control of them. Yeah. Yeah. You that's have, good. we, we, there's a school of psychology, um, internal family systems, bit of a clunky name, but, um, it really just talks about how we have, we all have different parts in our psyche. So you may, I have, I'll just speak for myself, anxious part, angry part, selfish part, but I also have like amazing parts. Yeah, altruistic part. And so if you can develop a warm, uh, well, some clear seeing, and I think it's very helpful to have some warmth too, vis-a-vis all of these parts, 
the guy who founded IFS wrote a book called No Bad Parts. Um, and so even the quote unquote bad parts, the ugly parts, the demons are trying to help you. <laughs> it's the organism trying to protect itself. So all my fear and anger and selfishness is just survival mechanism, not healthy. And I don't want to give into it. But if I can drop out of it and see it clearly with some warmth, then I can access the, the saner, wiser parts of my personality, which are there and hardwired in all of us. That has been incredibly helpful for me. And so meditation, which we, we described earlier, is this way of seeing your mind more clearly that can give you the insight into what, what's happening at any given moment so you're not so caught up by it. I'll just give you one other little hack. It's a big hack, but it's not complicated. If you can get into the habit of talking to yourself differently, this is going to feel, and for, for me, it felt very forced and treacly and cheesy and annoying, but there's a lot of data behind this. We tend to talk to ourselves in ways that if anybody else talked to us that way, we would punch the other person in the face. And we have this story, I think many of us do, that that is how we are going to succeed and survive. But actually, if you can move your inner dialogue away from a drill sergeant to a coach, you are, and the data showed this very clearly, more likely to achieve your goals. A coach does not let you off the hook. A coach points out your mistakes clearly and kindly, but is still rooting for you. And you can do that for yourself. Think about, I mean, the, think about how you talk to your friends. Um, you talk to your friends in a very supportive coach-like way, I hope. You can do that for yourself. And that's, if I could leave you with any hack, that's the easiest one. That's a great hack. We're so mean to ourselves, you know? It's, it's, it's unbelievable. one moment after another of suffering. This is a, not my metaphor, but I like it. It's like you're in prison, but you don't know the door's unlocked. You can walk out at any time. These tools have been honed for millennia and now verified by science. I'll quote one other, uh, one other Zen master, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who says, happiness is available. Please help yourself. <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay. How do you think about marketing your first book? How do you think about marketing your new book coming out and what role that plays in your success? I think it's crucial. Honestly, I like, I probably will call you uh, as I'm thinking about uh, marketing this next book. You had so much success. Was there some outsized thing you did besides come up with a incredible title and having a great book? Was there some outsized thing you did that led to 10% becoming such a global phenomenon? There, there were some, <laughs> to go all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, there were some unfair advantages I had. Like I happened to work at the largest media organization on the planet and they decided to back this book to the hilt. Now they do that not infrequently with in-house authors and those books don't always take off. So I'm not saying it was all that, but that was a huge part of it. What I think the recipe that I stumbled upon that I really like, and I'm going to use over and over, there's a playbook that I'm going to try again with this next book is narrative like finding a really good story because that is primordially pleasing to people. So in the first book, it was about a anchorman who had, a, who had an on-air panic attack because he'd done too much cocaine after being in war zones. And that led him to find meditation through lots of strange twists and turns. And so uh, that's a decent story. It's uh, a great story. Marry that, marry narrative to something that's actually useful for people. Because my story, as much as I'm interested in it, isn't that interesting. You got to have a takeaway. So for me, it's narrative plus utility is what I think is at the heart of anything I've done that's successful. And so for example, this next book about love is I have what I think is a pretty good story and I will marry it to a bunch of techniques that I believe would change your life. And honestly, this is going to sound a little naive, but could change the world. I don't think it's naive at all. I think it's totally possible. All right. Uh, we're going to wind down here. Do you have a mantra or a quote? Um, you have a lot of them, but do you have one that you always go back to? Yeah, for the benefit of all beings. I got it tattooed on my wrist right next to my watch um, right here um, so that I see it all day long. 
um, I think the hardest part of personal growth, self-improvement, spiritual development, whatever, the hardest part is that we forget all the stuff that we hear on a podcast or reading a book or whatever. We forget because we're wired for, you know, denial or pleasure seeking. And we just, we forget. So for me, tattooing for, <laughs> for the benefit of all, of all beings right on my wrist has been very helpful. And I try to come back to it throughout the day before I do anything, you know, before I eat, you know, before I brush my teeth, before I exercise, just try to remember, like, I'm doing this so that I can be healthy and happy so that I can make other people healthier and happier. And again, it's a little corny uh, for me, at least, but it's 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 my thing. But it's a guiding principle of every choice you make. It could be for the benefit of all beings, parentheses, including me. Or I just think of myself as part of the all, you know, and yeah. and I get this wrong all the time. I cannot stress this strongly enough. And that's not just false modesty. It's genuinely true. And I, I say it to be helpful because <laughs> it's, it's very common. You might have experienced this for us to learn something, some new thing, some new good thing like meditation or self-compassion or the aspects of the Dharma, and then to immediately use the thing as a way to beat the shit out of ourselves for failing at the thing. And I actually think the failure is like part of the process. It's the path. Uh, and so it's okay. I have this tattooed on my wrist and you catch me at the wrong day, the wrong moment. I could be being an asshole, um, a selfish prick. Like you're going to get off course, but you got to get back on course and you have to give yourself grace. Yes. That's the, that's the important thing is you got to find grace because there's always a reason to beat yourself up. Always. This is exactly where that move from the drill sergeant to the coach. That's exactly where this, that's where the rubber hits the road, the grace. All right. Do you have an inspiration, a recent inspiration? Um, I'll go first. So my inspiration recently is working with our friends, uh, Chodo and Koshin. I'm inspired to help them reach a bigger audience because when I think of for the benefit of all beings, whether it's working with that Zen center or something else that's helping the world. What I want to do, what I'm inspired by is helping other people that are making the world better reach a bigger audience. That's what I'm motivated by. Is there an inspiration that, that you've had recently? I just love what you, what you just said. I was so happy when I found out. We hadn't been in touch for a while, and then I saw you at a Zen center event. I just couldn't have come up with a cooler marriage of humans and talent because Koshin and Shoto are doing this incredible work in the world. A lot of what they do is train people to be hospice volunteers, which is like the secret society of superheroes who are tending to the most vulnerable. I'm doing it. It's, I've done their, it. their program too. It's, it's incredible. Um, yeah. So good on you for doing that. And, and you are such a good marketer. I've seen it. I'm not just flattering you. We, People should go look up the story we did together, which is how we met, where you taught me how to m make a video go viral. Like you're really. It was easy back then. Yeah, it's hard now, but. Um, <laughs> it's impossible now. But yes. You are very good at this. And um, the fact that you're marrying those skills to what they're bringing to the world is just is really cool. Um, so even hearing you say that is inspiring, frankly. What do you have an inspiration recently? I'm really focused on this next book. I am. To tomorrow, I hope, going to send out the latest draft. I sent out a full version of this book two years ago after four years of work. I started writing at 18. In 2022, I sent out a full draft and my editor was ready to publish. And I got some notes from people that were really thoughtful and I spent two years rewriting it. And so I'm about to hand it back in. I, I feel like I have this shot because of my platform. I've got this shot to speak to so many people about probably the most important human capacity, which is love, kindness, compassion, giving a shit if you want to be a little bit more glib. And I, I, I really want to get it right. And so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm closer. Well, you feel like you're very, you're very happy with it. Uh, no, 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 no. I actually am. I'm not very, I'm, I feel like I've made a lot of strides in the last two years, but what I'm handing in is, is deeply imperfect. But you think it can change the world, so it has to it has to be pretty fucking good. I don't know if the book will change the world. I think the human capacity for warmth can change the world. 
And if I can nudge that, that will be enough for me. You know, we, we live in really pessimistic times, which I think are not supported by the data. I mean, there are a lot of problems in the world, but um, the data show that we've never been safer, healthier, more educated, wealthier. Again, this is not in any way to diminish the problems. There are wars, there is inequality, there are economic um, uh, barriers put up for uh, certain groups of people that are unbelievably unfair. So there are plenty of problems in the world, and yet we've never had it better, and yet we've never been more anxious, depressed, addicted, lonely. And I think there are many bugs in the human <laughs> operating system, but there's one amazing design feature, which is it feels good to do good. And I think we can ride that to the salvation of the species. And so I don't think my book is going to change the world, but if I can nudge us towards seeing that, that self-interest which is also other interest, which is also the same thing at the same time, that would help. You have a big audience and a big platform. Yes. If you can be one arrow in the quiver yes. of, of moving the world forward, that's very powerful. That's why I'm obsessing over the quality of the book because yeah. um, I feel like I want to get it. I want to get it right. What's a lesson that you've learned recently? Mine is my wife for a living helps brands do good in the world, like find a purpose for what they're doing. And, you know, sometimes I contribute to the problems of the world because you mentioned earlier, greed, thinking you need a product, thinking you need a shoe. That's part of what I do. Like that's part of marketing and advertising is creating desire for people to want things. Um, the lesson I'm learning is you can also use those skills, those same skills that create desire to put good in the world and make the world a little bit better at the same time. So I'm always thinking about that. And you can also have brands can play a role in that. You know, brands can do the things they do to make the capitalistic wheel spin, but they can also play a hand in making the world better. That makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, I, I capitalism has capitalism has so many flaws and yet I'm definitely a capitalist. I don't see any other better system. Um, I'm open to being shown one, but I haven't seen it yet. So I think it's about doing the best we can with this system um, and what your wife and now you are turned on by is, I think it's really important. What is one lesson that I've learned recently? I'm constantly relearning the disutility, the stupidity of trying to force meditation on anybody. Um, I've been very careful not to force it on my own son. Although, as you know, he does do a little bit of it and can teach people how to do it. Um, but I, he said to me recently, Daddy, I'm bored. And I said, well, how does that feel in your body? And he, was like, and he said, is that a meditation thing? Because if it is, I don't want to hear it. And it was, it was just a great lesson for me. And just keep my mouth shut. The best way to proselytize is to be a decent person um, and let people get curious based on that rather than you know, wagging your finger at them to do a thing. I don't think you, it doesn't maybe, maybe with your son, but it seems like you take a very light touch on nudging people towards it. Maybe the lesson is take that light touch even in your own backyard. I think it's just a lesson you have to learn over and over and over again. All right. Last question. We'd like to dare our audience to do something, a double dog dare. My double dog dare this week is don't let perfection stand in the way of of progress or doing something, whether it's, you know, maybe I was thinking about it for you sh on the streets of New York, shooting a video that might be helpful to someone, not worrying about the lighting or the angle or, but just doing it. And I think maybe it's related to your book. I, I, I related to things I'm trying to accomplish because sometimes the thing isn't good enough in my mind to go out the door. And if I stick with that, nothing will ever get out the door. <laughs> That's my double dog dare is do something and don't overthink it. It's great. I'm going to double down on your double dog dare, which is put it in different language, which is take a calculated risk and calculated, you know, it's not willy nilly. And so with my own work, for example, you know, I'm, I am fastidious and obsessive about the book, but I'm also pumping out, taking risks on social media, on my podcast and t-shirts I make or sh live shows I do, I'm constantly experimenting. Um, and if I'm not failing with some regularity, I'm not doing it right. And so even the book is a, it could fail. 
It could be a six year, seven year waste of time. Um, but I don't know if you're not taking risks like that. What are you doing? I love that. All right. Thanks for your time, Dan. Where can people find you? Last question. Uh, DanHarris.com has links to everything. Well, thanks for your time. I know you've got to get back to polishing your imperfect but amazing book. And thanks for taking time to chat with us. I also want to just say that um, I loved your live event for the 10th anniversary. And I hope you put something in the world that is a mini tour similar to that, because I think it will help a lot of people. Thank you. I'm making a note to come back to you and talk to you more about that. Um, Yeah, I love talking to you. I wish I saw you more often. This was great. Thank you for having me on. Soul and Science is a mechanism podcast produced by Maggie Bowles, Ryan Tillotson, Tyler Nielsen, Emma Swanson, and Lily Jablonski. The show is edited by Daniel Ferreira with theme music by Kyle Merritt. And I'm your host, Jason Harris. Jason Harris.